Are you ready to take action to attain the lifestyle of your dreams? It's a great way to make a lot of money fast, fast, fast. The Clever Investor Show. Hey, welcome back to The Clever Investor Show. Really excited for today's episode. We got an amazing, stupendous, I've been calling a lot of guests stupendous lately. She is absolutely amazing and stupendous. One of the best investors in the game. She is my personal mentor when it comes to multifamily. She's done over $900 million worth of multifamily deals. Uh, she's a rock star as a mom, as an entrepreneur, as a businesswoman, as a thought leader in our industry. She's crushing stages and helping a lot of people out right now. We got the great Vina Jetty with us here Thank today. You. Thanks for I'm having me. I'm excited to have I'm excited. one of my mentors on the show and we're in our brand new studio. I know and it looks so if good. If you guys you know, are listening to this, we're actually, we built out the state of the art Clever Investor Show Studios. Yep. So you got to go to our YouTube channel if you want to check that out. The Clever Very Investor YouTube channel. Very in line with the brand. It, it is it's pretty like, dope, right? It's top of the top. You know, best I had to best. make the sign big. I love it. Big, because I we're going to take this. the show to the top. And by the way, thank you guys for listening uh, and, and just all the amazing reviews we have in a very short amount of time. I launched this not too long ago. It's good. And we have hundreds of reviews already. Yeah. Five star. I haven't even got a four star review yet, Vina. Yes. We just got to keep it going, right? There we go. That's because we have amazing guests like you. And so I want to get a little bit in your background and then let's talk about like how you're investing right now. Like this show's all about making money, having fun, breaking free the rat race, but more importantly, like just how to make your money matter and live life on your own terms. Because there's a lot of people, like multifamily is kind of scary. Yeah, I've had Grant on the show. You know, he kind of challenged me. Like you always challenge me behind (laughs) the scenes. You know, he's like, making fun of me because I'm a builder and and I do single family. And I'm like, God, you sound like Vina. I didn't put him up to it, I swear. Yeah, But, uh, you know, I want people to kind of walk away with some, maybe some tactical stuff. Yeah. Um, This is going to be, Vina is really, really smart. Like one of the brightest people I know. It must be in your DNA or something. Is that an Indian thing? I think just, it's an Indian born thing. Brilliant? Yeah, I think it's an Indian thing yeah, for like sure. It. Like no one else has a chance. No, it's no, only I already just, have given uh, up. <laughs> I just, no, I'm, you know, I just call you when I need I was any say, advice You know what whatsoever. makes me really smart though is I just find people that are way better at what they do and then I just partner with them instead. Yeah, me too. <laughs> like, That's why I keep giving you all my money to get into your deals. Um, <laughs> ride so, their um, coattails. You are the founder yep. of Vive yes. Funds. Yes. Not Vivi. Not Vivi. Not oh, Vivi. I guess it depends who you ask. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Potato, but, potato. Yes. Um, and uh, Vive Funds is a multifamily investing fund. And yes. you guys have, wait, you, your latest part, you just bought something just a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. How- we bought uh, 192 units in the Research Triangle of North Carolina. What does something like that cost? Um, Around 40 million. No big deal. Actually, it's funny because that's the smallest deal we've done in a very long time. It, now, are you? did you do that because it was a great opportunity or the market's shifting and you're kind of like being careful or like what made you want that deal? We, it, it was a great opportunity, but also we actually had it as a two property portfolio that we were buying. So we were actually buying another asset and it would have put the total portfolio over a hundred million. But then the other property, we fell at escrow on it. So there was a fire during due diligence. At the property. At the property. Doesn't that mean you get a bigger discount? You would think. Yeah, they, they didn't want to. You would wanna, think, but they, they didn't want to play ball. And so we're like, all right, well, I guess then instead we're just not buying this we'll anymore. Buy this, this, yeah. this little deal, this the little, little deal. $40 million, yeah. dollar, we'll be forced to do that. Right. So like, let's kind of walk through this. So people who have never, like, what's your biggest purchase so far? Uh, $103 million. $103 million. That is a staggering number to Every single yeah. person listening, including myself, has been in this game for a long time. Right. So that seems very overwhelming. So let's kind of walk through the evolution yeah. of Vina. Like, how did you get even to a $40 million right. deal, let alone a hundred plus million dollar deal? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, like the best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time, right? So I definitely don't think people are going to just start off at a hundred million dollar deal. And quite frankly, I didn't know I would ever be doing hundred million dollar deals. Uh, but the first deal I bought, multifamily deal I bought was actually $15.9 million. And we sold it three and a half years later for twenty four million, which is the power. So, of so let me scale. just do the math on that. We got rich. <laughs> yeah. One deal, we got rich. Just a little. All right. So, so that has to feel pretty and good. So, yeah, it felt good. Yeah. I mean, it always feels. Did you good just stare me. at your bank account like every day? You just refresh. Like I'm still rich. You know what? Refresh. There's still millions. No, because I'm. I always feel poor. 
Because one, I hang out with like really successful people who I'm like, okay, I'm like the poorest one in this room, which is fine by me. I want to be the dumbest and the poorest in every room I'm in. But two, I also redeploy my cash quickly. So it was right back into going to work. Right back into whatever. Even if it's not my own deal, I'll put it into other How do you buy a deal like that? How did you like make that first decision to leap into something that, that even sounds big. Oh yeah. I guess 15 million is a lot. It, it I mean, does sound big when you're in starting in like the single family space. Yeah. Like now I wouldn't even look at a $15 million deal yeah. quite honestly, but um, I started in the single family space and you know, my mom's a single family investor and that's how I got my foundation in real estate. And then, you know, I graduated from college with my degree in finance and then went to corporate America, made a bunch of money for big corporations. Mm -hmm. And then I paid taxes for the first time married. And my husband's a high income earner and he he was W2 at the time. And I was like, wait, what just happened right now? Because we paid like $200,000 in taxes. Yep. And so I call You're my like, this, mom. This, this single family thing sucks. Well, I wasn't in single family yet. That, oh, this, uh, this is, is when, when I was in corporate. corporate. I was oh, W2. Yeah, yeah. So it was really bad. Yeah. So you, you needed and real estate. I needed real estate. That's why I called my mom and I was like, mom, what do I do? And she's like, quit your job and go and be a full-time real estate professional. I was like, okay, this seems legitimate. I'm just going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Mom pushed you. Yeah. Mom was like, oh, quit your job. There's no other way to do this. And so I was like, okay. So I quit my job and started buying single family because I didn't know you could buy multifamily. I didn't know. I thought it was only for like the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts and Oprah, you know, like I didn't think it was for like you and I. And so I started buying single families. I bought, I remember it was this one week, I bought five houses in that week. And I was like, oh, this is not sustainable. This sucks. I don't want to do this ever again. It's a lot of work. Um, Yeah. And I really hate managing tenants. I hate managing contractors. Like I don't want to do any of that. And so I was like, I need, there's got to be a better way. I have to get to scale. And so uh, I found someone that I partnered with on my very first deal. And he, you know, really is the one that opened up the world of multifamily for me. Um, And we're still good friends to this day. And I actually invest with his company. He invests with our company. And I love that. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, that's good. It's my my mentor. I still talk to him all the time. We've made a tremendous amount of money together. Yeah. You know. I well, wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for that door opening. Yeah. You still walk through it, though. I mean, that's the thing. You, you got to walk well, through you it. Well, you ran through it, I think. I mean, you know? I, yeah, I did, run, I did run through it. And it was great timing because that was when we were at like the heydays of real estate, right? Of multifamily, especially. But what I learned actually there more than anything is what OPM, like other people's money, actually means. Because for the longest time, I thought it meant, oh, okay, I got a bank loan. So Chase is other people's money. What I didn't realize is you could raise the equity, right? And you could have a security that would bring odd, like people yeah, like so you and walk, me into just, it. Just break that down real fast yeah. for everybody listening. Like even at a $15 million deal, you you, you still got to put what, yeah, 20% as, down, uh, 25% yeah, down? Yeah, yeah. At that time it was 20% down and we had probably like another half a million in CapEx budget, so capital expenditures. That you had to come up with. Yeah, so I think we probably brought like five million to that deal would be my okay, guess. Okay, so, so you're sitting there. You, now, you, you brought in this other guy to mm-hmm. help coach you through yep. this. Is he putting up the money? Is he helping you raise the money? Or are you- Both, we JV. Because, and just for everybody listening, this is actually a hack. I mean, Vina's, I don't, I'm guessing, because your husband is a doctor- Yes. And yes. He, as an anesthesiologist, you have an in with people who make a lot of money. Yeah, I do. <laughs> that you can maybe like be like, hey, I'm doing this thing over yeah. here. Do you guys want to park some money and get involved? Well, but you know what? My first raise, I had to raise $1.2 million in six weeks. And nobody wanted to give me any money because they're like, but you haven't done this before. I'm like, yeah, but look at all these other things I've done. And they're like, okay, come back when you're on your second or third deal. And so it, it was actually really hard. I cried myself to sleep for like six weeks straight. <laughs> I thought we were. So how'd you get money? I ultimately I had um, a couple of people in my network that ended up trusting me, but I was like, "Babe, we have to sell everything we own. We gotta, you know, liquidate the four hundred one k's. We gotta sell your Porsche." And he's like, "Wait, what? (laughs) We're going all in on this. (laughs) We're going to do this." He's like, "Okay, I guess if." He's like, I feel like this doesn't make sense. Like, listen, I think you're beautiful and you're smart, but we are divorcing right now. So I'm not getting rid of the Porsche. (laughs) 
<laughs> it was like priorities yeah. at that point. <laughs> All right. So, but you you came up with the 1.6 million. 1.2, yeah. 1.2 million, six yeah. weeks. And is that all the money you needed? Yeah, that was like the last bit of it to get the deal closed. Who put up the rest? So I I had my partner on that who brought in the rest of the capital. Got it. Okay, so, so that was your first like, hey, go raise this amount. Yeah, then you I got can, this. You can yeah. earn a spot on the squad. Right, and I, I learned a lot too because then, you know, there's post-close management. So we were handling a lot of different aspects of the management side, which I knew enough of from corporate, but not in this type of environment. And so I learned a lot there on that first deal. And I was like, okay, I can really hope this goes well. I really hope this goes well. And it did. So. Okay. So you're now uh, having the greatest mentorship experience because you're doing a real deal. Yeah. This isn't watching a video. No. This isn't reading a book, going to a seminar. You're actually just fumbling your way through a yep. deal. You have an expert by your side. Yep. You get to watch the entire process. You said three years. Yep. Did you buy more deals during those three years? Yeah. 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 We so bought now a bunch. You're on. Yeah. Once we did the first one, the first one's always the hardest. It's after that first one, it gets easier and easier. Well, actually, it doesn't get easier. You get better. Yep. Right? And you know more. And like, I look back at how hard it was to raise 1.2 million. And today, you know, we raised, last year, we raised like 50 million in eight weeks. And Mm. so I'm like, that was, you know, some people, it's just like one phone call for me to raise $1.2 million now. But I think the key is having really good product and really good. I think I gave you like a hundred grand or something. You did. You gave me, you gave me money. More money than that? 150, 200? I don't even remember. Why is that all you gave me? I'm a big contributor to that 50 million is what I'm saying, (laughs) ladies and gentlemen. Why is that all you gave me? But that's actually the real question. Hey, look, that was our first, that was one of our first deals. So it's like I had to baby step in. Now I, now I know you're a money making machine. I want to give you all my money. I love that. I'll take all your money. Yeah. <laughs> You're like falling down the rabbit hole of multifamily. That's right. Well, we, we you know, what's funny about that, I told Brian, because you've been harping on me forever. Forever. Um, and, you know, Grant's harping on me, my friend Jerome, everybody in multifamily is like, Sperber, you're way too talented to yes. not be make, you know, playing the game scale. at a bigger level. Get up to scale. And we've done a lot of multifamily, but we've always like kept it a short period of time, yeah. flipped it. Like we've never right. stayed in it as yeah. like, I'm never going to sell this asset. I just want to own it like for a forever. long time. forever, Yeah. And um, we burned the boats in 2023. This is the year of multifamily for us. So we actually have been saying no to good deals in the single family space and just selling them instead of keeping them. Yeah. And uh, uh, I mean, we're still making, I mean, it's still. I mean, yeah. We still made $80,000 last week selling one of our good deals. (laughs) However, if we would have kept that, we would have made 15 grand a month as an Airbnb, something like that. And it's like, no, we have to make the call. Yeah. Your opportunity cost is way too high. Yes. You only have 24 hours in a day. Yeah. And and I want to do a, at least a thousand units this year, I which means will. I got to be real aggressive. You can do this. And just, you know, so, you know, so Vina actually started pushing us to like creating our first fund because when you become a, prof- especially for me, like I, I tell everybody that, that listens to this, you should always be building your brand constantly yes. because you never know when you're going to need that marketing firepower and that that relationships. Yeah. Like I started this podcast. I do all my content on Instagram and, and all the videos and stuff I put out on YouTube. That's to build a relationship with people yeah. so I can hopefully have their trust, raise yeah. money from them, put them in our deals make and do, we want to make yeah. money together. And we want to do multifamily yeah. now. And that's all we're focused on. Like last year, I think we raised, what let's call it over the last two years, maybe let's call it 6 million. All right. Okay, not a ton. But it funded our. But it's our, enough for single family. We we crushed it. We got twenty re, you know new builds or rehabs Amazing. going on at any time. You've given us money, yeah. and we could tell that story. <laughs> I think that's a good story. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, yeah. Why not? Okay. You know, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. Right. Um, if I would have applied myself the same energy to multifamily, multifamily. I would have ten x how much I my net worth yes. would have been. Yes. And I realize that now. And it's, but you got to have the right vehicles to do it. So building your brand is like part of it because you need a megaphone. Right. Money flows to where attention is. Like it's not going to go to a negative space. It's not going to go to somebody who they don't like your first deal. It's like, yeah, "Yeah, come back when you've done a couple of deals. Right. They want to have that trust in you. And so um, you mentioned some terms, CapEx. Yeah. And, you know, after we bought it, we had to do, what did you call it? I don't know. Post-close whatever. operations. Post-close yeah. operations. <laughs> it's like none of us listening have I any know. clue what any of this is. So walk us through an entire multifamily deal. Okay. Do you have to have a fund? Because there's GPLP. Mm-hmm. Explain that. 
explain where you're getting these deals. And then now you analyze it. Then you, do you set your fund up first and then you raise the money or do you find a deal first and then set up a fund and then raise money? Like walk us through the yeah. whole, maybe this last $40 million deal, the okay. whole arc. Okay. So to find the deal first, a lot of our deals are on market because that's just like the size we're transacting at. Usually they're going to be on market or at least with a broker, you know, in their pocket. Um, so that's the vast majority of ours. There are many deals that trade offline or without any broker involved. Those are just not our target deals. Um, so we find the deal, we'll underwrite it, then we'll start doing due diligence on it. So we'll comp shop. So we'll look at what our competitors in the area are doing, how much they're charging, what amenities they have. Do they have granite and stainless steel? Do we need that? So we'll kind of do that comp audit or amenity audit um, to see what we need to put in the asset. And, you know, we'll submit our LOI, our letter of intent, and we'll say like, okay, this is who we are. This is what we want to pay for it. Here are kind of the, the major deal points, right? Um, and then assuming that we win the deal or we're awarded the deal, um, then, and actually before that, there's a, a best and final round. Do you know about this? No. Okay. So in multifamily, so in single family, right, you like go in, you make your offer. Maybe there's like 10 offers and then the broker might like negotiate with you back and forth. In multifamily, what they do is they'll set up a CFO, a call for offers. And they'll be like, okay, Cody, you're interested in Main Street apartments. Submit your offers by January 31st, right? So you're going to submit an LOI and like maybe 20 other people will submit. It depends on where we are in the market cycle. Today, maybe it's a little bit less. But um, last year when we bought that deal, it was there were like 47 competing offers with us. Oh, wow. So all 47 offers come in. And then the broker goes, okay, um, you are the top five. And they'll go back to the top five and they'll be like, okay, Cody, you're in the best and final round. So now you have to resubmit your offer. They won't negotiate with you. They'll just be like, there's five other people in the best and final so they're round. They're just hoping you bump up yourself and negotiate you, against yourself? Yeah, you basically, you negotiate against yourself. And do you bump up or do you- some, Usually, yeah. Okay. So usually we go so into the first when, round knowing that we're going to have yeah. to bump up. So we kind of pull it back a little bit. All right, that makes sense. And then, oh, this is the secret sauce. Okay. There's a secret best and final round. <laughs> <laughs> no one talks about it. I don't know that why. Was the end, but yeah. there's more. Yeah, but there's more. Just send us more money. Basically. Yeah. So what they'll do then is they'll conduct buyer interviews. And so I, like if I'm selling the property, I'm gonna call you and say, Hey Cody, uh, I see you're interested. You're gonna pay me $50 million. Um, what's your track record? How did you underwrite the deal? What assumptions did you make on this? Where where's your debt coming from? This is from? the owner? Yeah. Uh, usually the seller or the seller's representative will. Okay. Do this, and so they'll have all five of those calls, and then at the end, the broker is going to be like, "Okay, Vina, Cody's really the best one with the most assurity of close. You know, his offer is a little bit lower. Let me go back to him, see if I can get a little bit more. But I think he's he should be the clear front runner. So then the broker is going to come back to me like, "Hey, Cody, uh, they really like you, but the deal is yours if you add two hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars or whatever." And you're going to say like, yes or no or whatever, right? And then um, you're going to come back and you're going to give me another LOI. We're going to sign it. Then we're going to negotiate PSA, purchase and sales agreements. And that's where, you know, the lawyers get to make all of their money in the contract side. Um, And so we'll fill out their... So your real estate agent is not writing this offer up. You no. have you have attorneys involved. Yes, there are attorneys. Just clarifying. Involved. Yes, there listening. there are attorneys involved. Um, and you really want an attorney involved because this does not go on like your promulgated form in whatever state you're in, right? Like this is a, it's like a 60, 80 page document. And it goes into everything. Like it talks about who is the knowledge party, right? So if there's a material fact that should have been known or that is known and not disclosed to us, you might say, okay, Vina, I want you to be the knowledge party. And I, as a seller, I'm going to be like, no, I want the knowledge party to be like the admin who really wouldn't have or doesn't know it, right? So we have competing interests in that way. You want it to be the highest person on the totem pole as a buyer. I want it to be the lowest person on the totem pole as a seller. And so there's usually like negotiation around that. We spend anywhere on our deals because of the size, we spend anywhere from like 25 to 100 grand negotiating the PSA. Just going through the attorneys back and forth. Yeah. All the deal points. Yes. So even though we had an LOI with some deal points, that's just the first little baby step. Right. Now we got to go deep. Right. Massive document. Right. How long does that process take? Well, if you are really going, turning things around, usually you can get it done in about seven to 10 days. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. But it's like, it moves fast because time is of the essence in these things. 
Um, so then you get the PSA signed. We immediately start triggering. So like I have, I call my securities attorney, right? And I go like, hey, Nick, I need to raise $50 million and I have to do it in this amount of time. Go. So what's the close period on a deal like this? Like, so now, now you have the deal points worked yep. out. At this point, you have track record. Yeah. You got this great power team, which I'm going to open up here in yeah. a second because I want people to understand like what that yeah. looks like. Who, who's around you? Who's in my world? Already, I feel overwhelmed. You do? Well, yeah. Just no, because I'm you're like, break it down. No, I, no, no, no. You're doing great. Okay. As an explanation. <laughs> what I'm saying is I'm putting myself the in the shoes of, of a newbie it. and I'm like, oh my God, a securities attorney? I don't even have an attorney that takes care of my parking tickets, let alone a securities <laughs> attorney. Like I'm nervous already. 60 page yeah. document. Yeah. Like I failed class like, yeah. and cheated on all my tests and smoked weed. I mean. What are you talking about right now? Yeah. That's how I feel. So you have this power team around you. you. Do you have money lined up for this? Or is this just like, I know I can go raise the money. So we're going to, we're going to will this thing into yes, existence. I willed it into existence. Like basically pretty so, much the same as my first raise where I cried myself to sleep. I just do that just at larger scale. So now. what happened? So but you're putting up like a earnest deposit. Yeah. Which could be significant. Yes. That could, that's part of the negotiation and like trying to win the deal, right? Like maybe you're not going to pay me 55 million for the asset, but you're going to pay me 50 million. Give me a million dollars hard day one. Okay. Now for this $40 million deal, just give me an example. What kind of earnest are we talking? Uh, in today's market, maybe like half a percent ish. 1%. Yeah. And is it non-refundable? Uh, non you, well, we, it, that's part of like our competitive If you edge. want to win the yeah. deal, you got to go hard right away. Yeah. Say, hey, this is how serious we are. Yeah. Okay. That's your money. Yes. Okay. What if you don't have the money? Is that the next well, question? Well, it's just, I'm just walking people yeah. through this. Like, because like the idea of putting something under contract and spending a hundred grand on legal fees yeah. and doing all this stuff to get to a point where you're like, Not ooh, I got to raise whatever, $10 million, $8 million. Yeah. Like I got to be able to pull this together. Yeah. So, okay, here, people usually stop and they're like, wait, I don't have a million dollars of hard money to put up or earnest money to put up. Now what? So that's where par partnership, right? Yeah. That's, again, it, everything so is the whole come key back is, to So the whole key is like, you need a sponsor on your first deal. Yeah, you probably do. Yeah. You need a sponsor you on your a first Vina. deal. <laughs> yeah, or, we, we or actually even a Cody, right? Like if I were doing my first deal over today with the relationships I have around me, I would call you up and I'd be like, Cody, I know how to get us there. I just need some fuel for the rocket ship, right? And so I'd be like, give me a million dollars and then I'll make you my partner on this. You don't have to do anything. I will do the sweat equity piece of it. And because you're giving me what we call risk capital, right? Because if the deal doesn't close, that capital is gone, gone right? Yeah. So I might say like, hey, I'm going to give you X percentage of my cut just for giving me the seed money. And I'll give it back to you because I'm going to raise it back out, right? So All I'm going right, to give so it back to you. So this is like a short-term bridge type Very short-term bridge But well. you're going to earn some equity in the deal. You don't have to yep. do anything. You just right. got to put the capital, the yep. risk capital to get, get me exactly. going. Exactly. Okay, so and partnerships and a couple people with potential money that yes. can put up some risk capital. that Rich want friends. To earn, rich friends. <laughs> All right, see, I like how we're going. So it could be Vina or Cody or Venoti. Yeah, it could be anybody. Venoti. Venoti. Okay, is that like this our is like, our new thing? Our real estate name. Yeah, <laughs> I love yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> Venoti does real uh, multifamily. <laughs> Coming soon. <laughs> it's, it's this is a great <laughs> this is a great great movie. I can already visualize it. Um, uh, okay, so you now you have this team put together. Yep. You call your securities attorney and you're like, I need to put a fund together now. Like yesterday. And we got to go quick. Yes. And so talk to me about Nick. Yeah. Okay. Like ha, ha, <laughs> tell me the importance of this S, yeah. uh, SEC attorney. Yeah. Securities attorney. Securities yeah. Attorney. Um, well, he keeps me out of jail, which I really appreciate about him. Um, I also spend a lot of time arguing with him. Because of my own volition, most people probably don't have to. Uh, but what I do is I call them and I say, you "Hey, you lost me at volition." <laughs> what does that mean? I mean, you know, they're out of their own, like it's out of my own desire. Okay, so you yeah. just you just like to poke and push and yeah, just to like see where uh, like where's the line? How far really? can we go? Yeah, with like this? where's the line? All right, are you gonna say no to this and don't charge me for this? Remember, either. I'm dumb and in single family currently. So that is not even a, a year little from bit now. True. When I have a thousand doors, I'm gonna be using words like volition. I hope so. so. Yeah, no, it's mandatory. I hope so. I I'm hope already, so. 
I can already visualize I, myself. I see you. You're manifesting <laughs> it right now. And I love that. <laughs> All right. So yeah. So I call Nick and I'm like, Nick, um, you know, and I've been working with him for a long time too. Like I've been working with him since 2010, 2009. So like, you know, we have a, yeah, you, a history. You guys are right? homies. Yeah, we're and- homies. You work together. Yeah. Well. And we work together. And by really the way, well. love Nick. Yeah. Great, great guy. He's amazing. Yeah. He's great. Um, he's great when he's not telling me no. That's mm. the only time I really like Remember, him. Remember, he keeps us out of jail. That, okay, fine, fine. Vinodi, Vinodi, Vinodi doesn't Vinodi do Vinodi doesn't no, do jail. No, we are. No, we're not. We, I mm. wouldn't do well in jail. No, I'd be. We, we just wouldn't do well. I would not it's, not it's not our type of scene. Um, so anyway, so I, yeah, I call him and say, listen, I want to raise $50 million and buy Main Street Apartments. Or whatever. It doesn't have to be fifty million. It could be five hundred thousand, whatever, right? And then he will say, "Okay, great." He'll give me an intake form, which is like a billion questions that I'm like, I don't know, Nick. I don't know what state I want to be in court. Like that's what I'm paying you to tell me to do, right? So no, but he'll um, he'll so you just put question me. marks. Like don't actually, know. you know what I do? I just say uh, to be decided, to be decided, <laughs> to be decided, and then he'll call me up. He'll be like. The whole point of the questionnaire is, is to help move things along yeah. in a systematic way. When you do this, it doesn't just really put happen. Something in there, yeah, Nick. and I'm like, nope, yep. won't do it, Nick. All right. So, <laughs> and how fast can he put a fund together? So for us, um, it depends how many times I call him in a row before he blocks my number. But usually, I can get like on average, he'll tell you it's like four to six weeks. You can truncate that time frame if you turn things around. Usually it's like the lag time, right? Like he needs a bio from you and then, you know, you send it to your team and then it takes them a day or two to turn it around. And then it starts pushing the process back. Time is of the essence with your fund. Do you want to get it done fast as possible? yesterday. And what kind of fund is this? So we do a Reg D 506C fund. And I know that's like scary for people to hear like, well, I don't even know what all this means, but that's the purpose of having a securities attorney. They're going to tell you based on what you information you give them, they're going to say you should look at doing this type of fund or this type of fund. So there's a bunch of different exemptions you can rely on to raise this money. And that gives you the ability to raise money from accredited investors. That's my fund. Now, there are there are regulations and exemptions that allow you to raise it from unaccredited investors. But- there's like different levers that get pulled with that, right? So like if you do a 506B raise, Reg D 506B, I can take up to 35 unaccredited but sophisticated investors into my fund. But then I can't publicly advertise it, right? So like someone like you who has the brand, right? You always have a megaphone now. It would be a, probably a big problem because you can't talk about it at all. Actually, you don't want to take those 35 people right. on because I can't. You can't, I can't talk to it. all. Yeah, you can't. You got to go hand to hand else. combat and like call right. people and people I have relationships right. with. Right, but when you start out, usually that's what makes sense because the people that are going to write you checks are probably people you know. Yeah. Unless you have a track record and a brand, and I didn't have a brand when I started. I mean, I still don't really have a brand. I'm just going to learn from I'm you. I'm actually pretty impressed. You've been putting out a tremendous amount of content. It looks fantastic. You know, it's like all you. I know. Yeah, I'll tell you all the credit. Well, I I tell you this all the time. In my whole entire life, you're the one person that has been the most pivotal person in my entire life. Wow. Yeah, I tell you this. I know, but like that's that's a big statement. I mean, a lot of people have made you a lot of impact in your life. Made you a lot of money. They have, yeah. So that's really cool to be in that echelon. Yeah, no, you're like you're it. Yeah, that's great. You're it. Because yeah. you know what you did? It wasn't that you like came and taught me how to do like large scale multifamily and like all that. Like I was already doing that. What you did though was you plucked me out of Clubhouse, right? Mm-hmm. Like in the days of Clubhouse, of like a random room. We didn't know each other. I'm sure we have like, we had multiple common friends, but nobody thought it was a good idea to introduce us to each other. You plucked me out of there and then you opened this whole world to me that I didn't even know existed. It wasn't like I was like trying to get to some destination and I needed help yeah. along the way. You were like, no, Vina, you're doing it all wrong. And then you opened those doors and you've put me in rooms and you've just like championed me and you've like, you've given me entire masterclass sessions on how to build your brand. Like yeah. you're the GOAT. Well, thank you for saying that. And, you know, when I first met, I met Vina on Clubhouse. Yes. Which is an audio app. I was just listening to you. I didn't know yeah. you. I didn't. Yeah. I, I was listening to you. And I said, she's the smartest person in this room. And you are the smartest person in every room. And it was cool to listen to that. And so my secret 
always has been identifying talent. Yeah. Right? Like I can see talent and see the potential and where they can really go. And I've done it with a lot of people. And as soon as I heard you, I was like, oh, she's a superstar. Like, and you just need, I just open doors. Yeah. You walk through them. I just put you on. Yeah. And I've done that for a lot of people. Most of them have taken advantage of it and have gone off to become great. You are definitely one of them. And I'm watching you build this brand now. You're speaking on stages. You're murdering it. I know. And I think this is just the beginning for where you're going to take it. I think I think, I so. think you're going to be the number one female investor, influencer, educator, and you haven't even scratched the surface yet in the world. I really believe that. Wow. Yeah, you're fantastic. You. And you're you. you're now I'm watching you educate and and you're so good with explaining now cuz you you're so smart but now you're taking it and you're narrowing the conversation yeah. and like really helping people understand kind of like what we're doing here. Appreciate that. I love that. And um you came in and filmed an entire multifamily 101 course for me for Only my students for you. at Clever I've Investor. I've never done that for anyone else. No, I love it. You came in, you busted out in one day. I get so much great feedback. I don't sell that course. I just yeah. give it to my students. Right. I love that. Because, you know, I want everybody, if I'm on multifamily, I want everybody yes. to get on multifamily yes. with me. Right? I love it. Um, all right. So <clears throat> let's go back. I know. Thank you like, for all totally the nice things that you said about tangent. me. I'm going to play that clip a billion times. I'll be waiting for my check later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you call Nick. You're like, we got to get this fund done. Yes. He, he says, this is a type of fund. What does a fund cost on, yeah. in general? So it depends on what you're trying to do, right? And like how big, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so generally speaking for legal fees all in, you can plan on, because there's different filings you have to do in each state and you'll need him, you'll want him to do that. So I'd say like roughly we plan anywhere from 15K on the low end, it can go up to like 20K, 25K, which sounds again, like a lot of money to someone just starting out. But remember, this is part of the risk capital, right? So like, I'm going to go to Cody. I'm going to be like, Cody, I need the risk capital. I'm going to budget that in and I'm going to add this to my closing costs. And then I'm going to raise that money from the fund. The fund will ultimately reimburse you for this. Yeah. So this is just like floating capital. You can put on a credit card. You know, this is just to get you over the hump of where you start raising the capital. Once you raise the capital, you can start reimbursing yourself back. So now I have this fund set up, the paperwork set up. I got all the the contracts done. The deal points are done. I got to go raise, let's say, 8 million bucks, 10 million bucks, whatever that number is. Explain the pitch, the presentation-ish in general. Okay. Because like explain GPLP and like, how am I going to these friends, investors? And asking them about late, it. You know, I, you know, my mentor always said, you know, there's a lot of people out there with lazy money, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Uh, they, they don't know what to do with yeah. it. And right now, especially if the stock market's turbulent or, or bad or crypto's right. imploding, it's like real estate's future-proof. Yeah. Multifamily is one of the safest assets over the long term in it history. Is. You got a great sound bite you say all the time. Yeah. It's the, it's, there's like the some- high, Oh, it's got the high sharp ratio. Sharp ratio. Yes. And I was like, oh, that sounds ratio. fancy. That's, yeah, it's a high it's sharp like ratio. It's yeah, like it's like volition. Yeah. Uh, it's the uh, highest risk adjusted return that you can make on any asset class. Mathematically, like I'm not just, I am biased, but I'm not saying that just because I'm biased. Yeah. Like if you look at the amount of risk you take on relative to the amount of return or potential return, multifamily crushes every other asset class. Which is why smart Wall Street money poured <laughs> gazillions of dollars yeah. into multifamily because they, they know are. they see they see the long yeah. term. All right, so you explain the setup when I'm going to these investors. Like, what, yeah. what's my pitch? Okay, so let's talk about what GPLP is, right? So if I'm raising eight million dollars of capital, or let's say Cody and I are raising it together, right? We are the general partners on the deal because we're we have all control on the deal. We get to make all the decisions and passive investors or LPs, limited partners, they don't get any say in what happens here, right? So if we decide that we're going to go in and we're going to put like top of the line courts in an area that won't return that capital, like they're at our mercy to make good decisions on their behalf. So this is why it's a relationship business, right? And it's building that track record for them to know that, all right, Cody and Vina aren't total idiots that we're going to go and do that. We're going to go, we're going to do our market research, and then we're going to make the best business decision we can with the information we have. And sometimes it'll be wrong, but they trust us to do the best that we can at that moment and to actually take the steps to make that Can happen. there be 
five GP, 10 GP? Is there, is there, is it, is it like at a certain point, it's like they just don't do that. It's out of control. Or is it yeah. normally uh, just a few GPs? Yeah. Usually it's just a few. I, sometimes you'll see these offerings. Like I got one the other day where someone was asking me to invest and there were like 16 GPs on the deal. And I was like, okay, if things are going wrong, who's making, who, where does the buck stop? And nobody knew. And I said, okay, what if one of you wants to sell and the rest of you don't? And I'm like, well, then they just get outvoted. I'm like, what if that one person has the most experience and should be making that call? They're like, oh. I'm like, what if eight of you agree and eight of you disagree? What happens? And they're like, uh. And I'm like, I have no control on the deal. This is like betting on the jockey, not just the horse, right? Like the jockey matters a whole lot more than the horse because you can take a great sponsor and an okay an asset and it's probably going to end up being pretty good, but you can take a great asset and a terrible sponsor and then Screw run the it into the ground. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you really want to bet on the jockey and you want to know who's making decisions, who's in control of the deal. And so that's what I look for. So generally speaking, I'd say five or less is probably a pretty standard number. And you know, the larger the asset, there might be more general partners on the deal, but so some general partners lot. might be in charge of the asset, it's like management right. or whatever. Some might be just money raising partners. Mm, no, within securities rules. Oh, well, well explain yeah. that. So there's something called a broker dealer violation, which is you cannot get the broker dealer rule says you cannot get transaction based compensation for raising capital. So what that means is you can't come to me and be like, hey, Vina, let me partner in your next deal. And if you if I bring you a million dollars, you give me 5% of the deal or you give me $50,000, right? And for every million I bring, you give me 5% 50K. I can't do that because you're not a broker dealer. If you're a broker dealer, then sure, no problem, but you're not. And so what has to happen is like capital raising cannot be the only function and it has to be predetermined, right? So if you say, hey, I'm going to bring you 10 million bucks, give me 30%. And I say, okay, done, Cody. And then you go and you bring me $2 million. I still have to give you the 30%. Mm. Otherwise, it becomes transaction-based. Oh, I love this deal. So, yeah. I want that deal. <laughs> You'll do it well, exactly yeah, one time yeah, and then a, never you, again. Nobody's going to ever do <laughs> yeah. a deal with me. Okay. And um, so I actually have to physically be involved not just in money raising, I got to be involved in some part of the actual deal itself to earn my equity. If you're raising capital from someone else. If you're bringing your own money, then no. I, I understand that. I was just trying to like, yeah. um, like really like, like if, if I bring you the deal, yeah. now I'm in. Yes. But if I'm not adding value other than raising money, I can't right. just earn equity right. spot on the GP squad. Right. Okay. Right. And well, and the thing is, is when you're raising capital from your investors and your relationships, you want to have some kind of involvement, right? Like you want to be a decision maker. You want to have I just want clarity. Rights. Yeah. I want a clarity for people watching right. just because it'd be easy your first time to be like, I actually don't want to do multifamily, but I got some yeah. rich, rich uncles friends. and yeah. friends. Yeah. I'm just going to go to Vina and raise money and then weasel my way into the deal. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's not that clear. Not that, yeah. Not yeah. that simple. Okay. And that's why you need a neck. <laughs> yes. All right. So now, now we have the fund set up. We know how we're yeah. going to raise money. You got limited partners, which are putting up the money. Yep. They're accredited investors. Yep. Or maybe not, or maybe, depending, depending on the type on the of fund. Deal. Yes. And now you have a period of time where you're going out there right. and you're raising. Right. Hey, sorry for the interruption. I'm going to let you get right back to the episode. I just wanted to answer a question that I get all the time, which is where do I go to network with other high-level like-minded individuals? Where I go is the Avengers Real Estate Mastermind. It's an experiential mastermind. There's about 175 members. They're all super high-level. They're all gunning. They're all gaining skills and capabilities. Networking is off the charts. We bring in the biggest celebrities, rent out the coolest venues. We have a ton of fun. The training is off the charts. And I'm always ahead of the curve because of the members inside the Avengers. We're all collaborating and helping each other out. So if you're looking to get plugged into something super fun that's going to really lift your business up in a major way, check out joinavengersmastermind.com and watch the video that's on there. Read all the information and see if getting plugged into a mastermind would be right for you. That's joinavengersmastermind.com. If you fail in that raise, is the deal done and you lose your earnest and the whole thing falls apart? Potentially. But I like to think that we're entrepreneurs. So if, that, if it came down to that, I'd like to think that I would start being more creative 
about who I could partner with and bring in to help rescue me. Got it. There's always money out there, right? Like so if, if you the, raised f- six of the eight and right. you're falling short and you only got a day left, right? you're going to go hustle and I'm, get real creative real quick. Right. I'm going to be like, hey, um, you know, Susie, write me a $2 million check. Normally you'd get this amount of return. I'm going to give you a slice of my economics to make the deal happen. I'm going to personally guarantee it. I'm going to, you know, maybe secure my house to it just to get her to my get it. My husband's got a nice Porsche. Yeah, you can We're have the Porsche. That bad you got boy the up. Porsche. You got the Porsche. You drive it. <laughs> uh, you know, so that's, you want to start thinking creative and outside of the box, which I think as real estate investors, that's what we're really good at, right? Is when we're buying house, like we're great at structuring, even in the single family space. And so you can use those same principles in multifamily. It doesn't change. Sure. It's a relationship business. Okay. So now you got the funding. Yeah. You're now pushing the deal to the closing yeah. table. You're like, oh my gosh, we're about yeah. to get this thing. We're doing due diligence simultaneously. What does that mean? Right. So we are, you know, it's like trust, but verify, right? Like we trust what the seller told us, but now we're going to verify it. So we'll walk every single unit and we'll but do- But you've it. had appraisers go out. You've had inspectors yeah. go out. Yeah. Like you have a mountain yes. of reports right. that you're plowing through. Environmental, structural engineers, everybody's title has signed off on it. Um, and then, and our lender is doing their due diligence simultaneously. And then we're doing our unit walks. So we do unit inspections. We go into every single unit and, you know, we take photos of everything. We document any damage that's there. Uh, we document what kind of amenities are in the unit. So if one unit has stainless steel and the next one doesn't, we document unit 101 has stainless steel, unit 102 has black appliances. Unit 101 has granite, unit 102 doesn't. So we'll document all of that so that we can start planning when we renovate our renovation schedule. Um, So we're doing all of our due diligence during that time. We're getting our uh, contractors out to give us estimates on everything. So now we're really sharpening our pencil and fine-tuning our numbers. Um, We're also going in and doing a lease audit so we look at every lease to make sure all of the credit history is there. They're paying on time. We check to make sure that the rent they're paying is actually what they signed the lease to pay. Because a lot of times there's a discrepancy there. Uh, we look to see when are all of the leases expiring? Because what you don't want to have happen is, let's say you're buying 100 units and in May, 40 of them are expiring. That's going to cause a huge issue with your vacancy because what if all 40 leave? that'll be a problem for you, right? Because now you're going to have 60% occupancy. So we're looking at that. We're doing a lease audit. You want to see about one twelfth of your leases expiring every month. Okay. So it's like a general rule of thumb. I mean, sometimes it'll be a little bit more, sometimes a little less, but that's generally what you're looking for. So you're doing all your due diligence. It's now closing time. Yeah. You close. What, you get like an old school uh, janitor key ring with, yes, with, with 200 keys on keys. it. Yes, yeah, and they're, exactly. they're like, here's your Here new you apartment. go, enjoy. Um, no, so we close the deal um, and then we start the takeover, the transition. So interestingly enough, the computers go offline for a whole week with the pay accounts. So for the, the first week, we're they're shutting, the seller's shutting down their system. We're putting our system up and running. And I don't, I still don't understand like why there has to be a whole week delay, but apparently there does uh, because everybody does this. And I think it's just like the systems and banks catching up. I don't, I don't know why it takes so long, but it does. Um, And then we start executing the business plan, right? So we start renovating the units. We say we're going to renovate. The first, one of the first things we do is we power wash and um, we restripe the parking lots. Uh, That's just, Kind of our. Why is there a reason behind that? Uh, like yeah. a feeling of like, hey, new owners, yeah, fresh coat of paint, new, yeah, exactly, yep. new sheriff in town, and it also sends a message to residents like we care about your community, and it's like quick lipstick on the property, and it attracts new tenants. They look at it. They it's a first impression, right? First impression. Actually, matter. I think it's really smart. It's like yeah. what an affordable way yeah. to send a signal of like this place is like clean, right? Yeah. Right. And so it's easy. It's a quick win. Everybody's happy. The asset looks pretty. The curb appeal is immediately improved. Um, and so then we start, you know, we we have resident events to build community. We start renovating. We bring it up to market. Uh, we oftentimes will go in and revitalize amenities. So we really invest into our communities. So Bobby Castro, who's a friend of ours, that's a phenomenal uh, multifamily investor and another one of my good friends and a business partner. He uh, said, you know, Sperber, when I go into these new projects, a lot of people go in and they take the 
20 or 30 units or 10 vacant mm-hmm. units or whatever. And they immediately start renovating right. them and then raise rents and, yeah. you know, try to stabilize the asset. He goes, I don't do that. I go in and I just raise everybody's rent by like 25 or 50 yeah. bucks. And I just, I push it and I push it and I push it and I don't touch the property. Maybe some yeah. light lipstick on a pig, like, yeah. you know, some curb appeal, but like, I'm not renovating units until I hit that ceiling where people start right. complaining or saying, oh, I'm not going to renew my lease. Yeah. So he doesn't force the appreciation through renovation. He forces it through just bringing it to market, re- yeah. bringing it to market because a lot of people do mismanage or yeah. towards the end of their ownership. They're kind of like, eh, yeah. we're not going to mess with anything because we got to yeah. keep our vacancies really low. Yeah. Um, and then that's an easy hack to like yeah. get that up. Then you go in and renovate, push yeah. it even higher. And that's generally what we do too. We Because what you have to do is you first have to bring it to market, unrenovated market rents. And then, because if you don't do that, you don't know if you even have to put the dollars into renovating those units. Right? Like you might might not have to. Right. And then what you're doing is you're leaving enough, we call it like the meat on the bone, right? That we're leaving it for the next investor. So I'm going to, let's say I renovate 20% of the units out of 100, I renovate 20 of the units. Well, now when I go and sell it to you, you have 80 units that I've already proved the business plan on 20 of them. So maybe you'll renovate another 30 more. And then you're going to go and sell it to Bobby, who's going to say, oh, I have 50 more units that I can renovate. And Vina and Cody have already proven that people yeah, you don't want to roll in this. and renovate every single unit right and typically you can right if your end buyer is a turnkey investor who doesn't do renovations as their business plan then you, there might be a reason for me to renovate all 100 units but if i only renovate 20 or 30 percent of them now my buyer pool is completely different but it might be a better buyer pool so it's like an analysis yeah, you're I constantly get, get making you're and you know, five years in, seven years in, the tenants kick the crap out of the place or what, yeah. I don't know how long until you have to start the whole process all over again. I'd say like 10 to 15 years, okay, so, it kind of starts So just re, re, every 10 to 15 yeah. years, you're like starting the process. Over, over. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's your power team look like? Because this is sounds, there's a lot of moving pieces, yes. a lot of work, management. I don't see you collecting uh, rent checks, pass, <laughs> putting up five day notices, <laughs> knocking on doors. So yeah, what, no, what's your team look like? I do all of those things, Cody. I don't know what you're talking about. You're capable uh, of I mean, doing them. Yeah, especially the fixing toilets. Uh-huh. I'm really good at that. <laughs> um, no, so I we we have a whole entire team. Like like I said in the beginning, I just find people that are way smarter than me, and then I just like ride their coattails to success. So tell tell me That's what my key. power team yeah. needs to look okay. like. Okay, like I said, first and foremost your securities attorney. So Nick McGrew out of LA Polymath Legal, he's my guy. Um, Then my second person is my tax strategist. People overlook this when they're investing in multifamily, but you need this because not only is it tax efficient for you, but when you go to raise capital, rich people care a lot about taxes, right? And they're going to start asking you like, okay, so will I get a K-1 or a 1099? How does my depreciation work? Am I going to have to recapture it? And you're going to be like, what? I just said, give me a check. That's all. I want to stop after that sentence, yeah. right? Um, but having someone on your team to do that. So we use Larry West. And Shout out. What, Big Larry. Oh, uh, yeah. Big Larry. Big Larry West. Big Larry West. Out He's of, actually Larry D. West the third is his official yeah, name. Yeah. Larry Big D. West. Big D. West. The third. <laughs> the third. Wait, where, I where, wouldn't where, know where, that Where's he out of? Texas? Yeah. He uh, sounds he, like a Texas guy. <laughs> He's at, he's out of Dallas. Okay. Uh, Big D from Dallas. Big, <laughs> All right. Hey, shout no, out to Larry. Cannot. Killing it out there. <laughs> it's a strategy. No, he is. Because, you know. Good? Yeah, because it's not about what you make. It's about what you keep. 100%. Right? And yeah. he helps me keep all of it. So, in my first few years in the business, I was a proud tax paying. Uh, well, I was behind on my taxes, but I <laughs> I owed the taxes. You know, I eventually paid right, them right. With, with tons of fines and fees. I and love it. I love it. But you eventually you figured quick. it out. You, you figured it quick. out. You need some uh, Venoti in your life to get uh, <laughs> tax strategy. I love it. Yeah, no. So he's also important. Um, then we have our contract attorneys. So that could be the same as your securities attorney, could be someone different. Uh, For us, we find attorneys that are local to the markets that we're transacting in for the contract side. Our title company. um, So we immediately open title and get that rolling. Our lender, big, big, big part of our team. and I, is, that, is this like a local bank, a big bank, a credit union? Is this a so specialty lender? Yes, yeah, so there's like multifamily brokers. Uh, and usually if you don't have one, when you're buying from a broker, just ask them who their capital markets team is. They'll, 
they'll be happy to introduce you to whoever they use. Uh, we use someone uh, from Jones Lang and LaSalle. So JLL. Jones Ling. Jones Lang and LaSalle. Jones Lang yes, and LaSalle. They're like, I think they're like the number two in terms of size of real estate in the world. You know, size matters, Vina. Size matters. I've heard. I've heard. I've ha- I mean, I got to ask Larry. I don't know. I, okay, I, can't. I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about right now. I don't know what you're talking about I'm, either. I, <laughs> we need, we when need it comes that. to portfolios, I'm more of a grower, not a shower. <laughs> <laughs> you know when the video guys recording this laughing. start laughing. Uh, all right, so, so so okay, yeah. So, so so Lang gives you the money. Yeah, Jones Lang on the style, JLL. They give so you show money. up and you're like, hey, I've done this a billion times. Give me more money. About fifty million. on day one. I got to bring you in with me because yes. they're not they're not going to talk to me. That's correct. Yes, right? you need someone, the power player on your team that has done this before. That can so we call it being in like the country club when you can sign on multifamily loans because everyone can't just walk in and be like, "Hey, I need a multifamily loan." They're going to be like, "Because mm, they're, no. I mean, they're I'm are, I'm assuming they're not craw- crawling up your credit and, and, and going through your entire life trying to figure it out. They're looking at the asset. Yeah, they care about the business of the asset. They don't care about my credit. Which is why they want an amazing operator to show up with you because they're like, all right, who's- Can you really, actually do this? Who's really running who's this Who's driving thing? this ship? Yeah, exactly. And so um, they'll give us a loan. So the debt on the property or in the single family world, we call it a mortgage, right? Um, so they'll give us the debt on it. And simultaneously, you know, I'm raising my capital because Nick has given me everything. Larry's given me tools. And then the property management company, that's going to be the team that's going to execute. And we use third-party management. A lot of people manage in-house. We just don't uh, right now. I think maybe in the future it's possible, but for right now we don't. Um, so our property management company is going to be the other like big Use the team. same one on all your projects? We do. We do. We, we allowed I, to shout them out? Like- um. Yeah, we we can we so well. Th- this is the thing with property management companies, though. We tend to change because they have a lot of turnover in employees, and like really, it's not so much the company as it is your manager, right? So it's who's your regional on your assets, and if that person leaves and goes to another company, all of a sudden the asset starts getting like a little bit more turbulent, and so you really want to have somebody who is either going to be long-term or you might move companies. So that's why I say like, Got it, it. kind of okay. depends. But you want a good property management company. So they're handling all this stuff where you're not out there yeah. on the job side no. trying to de- deal Absolutely. with this. Yeah, it's, it's hard because people mix up asset management and property management and think that they're the same and they're not, right? We do all asset management in-house. So Everybody on our team is the one that's managing the manager. Have you heard that before? Like, oh, you just manage the managers. The property manager is who you're managing as the asset manager. So you're looking over the investment of the asset. The property manager is looking over the property and what's happening day to day, right? Like they know about where all the leaky toilets have been. I don't know that. Our asset manager will maybe know about it if it becomes an issue, but a routine fix, we don't really need to know about it. In the beginning, though, you were the asset manager. Yeah. Like, you got to kind of be yeah, the person be that figures it all out. Yeah. You hire the property manager. You figure out the SEC yeah. or, or the, the attorney. You're, you're working with the banks and the lenders and all that. But event now you have a team around you. Um, by the way, I didn't mean to cut you off. Are we done with our power team after property manager? Because uh, they handle, like, repairs. They handle yeah. collections. They handle you have Well, you also have out. your partners, right? Like, your JV partners, so if we do a deal together, like you'd be part of my power team. And if I did a deal with- Your other GPs are part of your power yeah, team. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Is that, that it? That, that's, I think that's, okay. that's the core. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. I was going to go somewhere with that, but it doesn't matter. I when mean, it start, sounds- When you first it, start, you Oh yeah, everything. when you first start, you're doing everything. And now do you have people you employ- yeah. As a business where you're like, hey, you're, you're gonna, I'm hiring you to be an asset manager on these yep. five assets. Yep. Yeah, so you have like your asset managers, your underwriters or analysts. Maybe you have like a director of acquisitions, um, your investor relations team, your admin staff. Um, so yeah, these are all people. Now that you got now, now that you're making the big bucks. You got people yeah. communicating with your investors, putting together your cool newsletters. Yeah, make sure everybody's in the know, and that's yeah. a big thing. Yeah. I learned that from you. How important it is investor communication. Yeah, because if you go raise, let's just call it even eight million dollars right. from. 30 people. Mm-hmm. 
those 30 people want to know for the most part, want to know without having to come and ask you. Yes. They want you to be out in front of it where it's like, you're just feeding them so much information that they leave you kind of alone. alone, That's exactly right. That's how we look at our communication. Like I'm, we're consistent, right? So every month and you, you get an email from me every month with a breakdown of, you know, this is what the occupancy is. This is what we're doing. This is how many we've renovated. Here are the resident events. And then here's like upcoming news information, miscellaneous, right? You get that from me every month, every quarter. You get financial statements from me that you can go. I'm positive you don't open any of these because most of my investors don't. <laughs> I've seen a few because I was studying yeah. it because I wanted to see, but, but yeah. most of my investors, once they're invested, they don't. They're good. Yeah, they don't care. They just want to see that I'm thinking about these things and that like I'm still doing the hard work. That's what they really are looking for. Yeah. They don't, they're not. And, and what I also love is in almost every bit of communication, you build the storyline and the essence of I protect the principal. I protect the football at all costs. That's my, yeah, we, could we make money? Awesome. Yeah, we, we probably will. My number one goal is not to fumble this football. Right. And when you f- feel that, you're like, oh, I trust her a lot more because I think she's really fighting hard to not yeah. lose. Yeah. Yeah. That and also we co-invest too. You know, that's the other thing. Like, yeah. We're her own largest LPs into our own deals. So there's no single investor that writes a check that's larger than my co-sponsor's family and my check. We're always the largest. Yeah. So that's amazing. And you've now done nine hundred million dollars worth of these types of deals. Yeah. Um it's not crazy. It's unbelievable. It's wild. You're gonna cross a billion. I in I deals. was hoping to do that last year, but then this deal fell out of escrow in November. Guys, if we can just go find Venus some deals. Please. She's so poor. I am. And just like, poor she's me. humiliated right now. She hasn't hit a billion yet. Yeah. All her other big multifamily friends make fun of her. I know. C- can we just find some deals for her and get her over that billion <laughs> yeah. dollar mark? Yes. <laughs> Let's go. Well, it's a team sport. So <clears throat> I'm going to need a team to do this. I love it. All right. So, and you know, as you were making money and we met on Clubhouse, we built yeah. a relationship. Yeah. Um, you know, I was building in the single family yeah. space. We were spec building. You know, these are two, $3 million houses. We stay in one or two zip codes. Like we're right. pretty tight with right. what we do. Focus. We build, build phenomenal houses. Yeah. Uh, you put up some money with us. Yeah. That's a great story. I'm telling you a story because I want you guys to understand something. Because the lesson in this story is very valuable. And it, it's a hard lesson to learn because mm-hmm. um, when we, when we went to V and we said, hey, we invested in your thing. Do you want to get involved in any of ours? And you said, yeah, I think I'll put up some money. And if it goes well, there's a lot more money behind it. Like I would like to kind of diversify a little bit. Actually, I think I invested into yours first. And then I came to you and I was like, I gave you money. Give it right back to me. Yeah, probably. (laughs) Well, either way, I mean, it was, we were investing in each other's deals. in each other's, yeah. And um, uh, so we bought this house, tore it down. And we're building a spec, right? Yeah. A beautiful, beautiful two and a half, three million dollar spec house. A spec house takes 12, 13, 14 months to build yeah. sometimes. We were pushing as hard as we could. The one that we did right before this, we made 400 grand or whatever on. It was a phenomenal deal. We we're yeah. basically building the same freaking house right. just Rinse with some, some, some modifications to fit on the lot. And over time, we also bought eight more houses Mm -hmm. and we started eight more projects and we're going through eight more plans and zones and permits and, and all this. And they weren't the exact same house. So they were taking up a tremendous amount of time. We were kind of starting to scale some of our building business. Things took longer. Yeah. But that's to be Things cost more. Yeah. Also, um, the market turned. The market turned. The market freaking turned. Right, right in, in the, the middle, middle of the of project. It. In June, it yeah. turned and we were like, oh my God. So we went to uh, our our partner, Garrett, who is building. Are we on track and on budget? He said, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. But we weren't dialed in. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't really know. There was too many yeah. moving pieces. And I think he thought we were yeah. on track and on budget. And so two, three months out, we send you a report. Yeah, we're on track and on budget. You're yeah. thinking everything's all good. Yeah. Two weeks before, a week before we were set to close, I get word from my partners that we're not on track and on budget. <laughs> yeah. Severely not <laughs> like on track and on budget. Not, yes. We're going to get the deal done. Right. And but the our, football's protected. And the deal, we, we what, what was our structure? We were going to oh, give you gosh. 25% of the deal? Yeah, I think we got 25% of the deal. And 
you put up a couple hundred, 250 grand or 300, whatever. Yeah. 300 grand. And you were going to earn 25% or be of cut the in equity, as, yeah. uh, 25% of whatever we, and right. you know, if we make 400 grand, right. you know, you'll make a hundred grand 100, on, yeah. on your 300. Right. So we'll give you back 400. Right. Not a bad return. For like 12 it's to 15 a, months. It's a win. Right. Yeah. We test out doing some yeah. single family and then we're off to the races. I get word that we might lose money oh, on this did? deal. Initially, it oh, was, hey, we I might not that. make money. And I went, that's impossible. Yeah. We just checked in a, a month ago when yeah. we were on track and on budget. We were going to make 400 grand. Yeah. What, what happened? What is going on yeah, right now? Right. Then we dug in a little deeper, ran all the numbers, and we actually were going to make a profit. Mm-hmm. We were going to make, what, a 56, yeah, 8,000? 56,000. Whatever, $56,000 profit, which sucks to build a house but the market turned. Yeah. We shit the bed on our end by overbuilding. We built too nice of a product. Mm-hmm. And what happened at the end is we pre-sold it, which yeah. caused the buyer to come in and say, no, no, no. I want the bike all rack. This. I yeah. want this light changed. I want this thing changed. Right. And we were trying to accommodate, accommodate the buyer. this yeah. buyer who is very particular. And next thing you know, 300 grand of app. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. Yeah. We, I, we were pissed. And so as partners, we were sitting behind the scenes. And we were like, what do we do? Because right. per our contract, we owe you 25% of whatever of the, the profit. profit. Yeah. But as an, a relationship, yeah. I was struggling with that. Because at first I was going to tell you, hey, not only did we not make money, which by the way, Vina would have never lost money. Yeah. We would have eaten the loss. That I mean. But it's like, hey, thanks for giving us 300 grand. You're, you make nothing yeah. <laughs> after a year. That's right. unacceptable. But now it's like, okay, well, we made 56K. Right. It's not what everybody expected. Right. I, we could have came and we talked about it. Yeah. Me and Bryant and Garrett sat around and we're like, what do we do? And everybody was going around. Garrett said, you know, give her her 25%. Mm-hmm. That's what the contract says. Bryant says, let's give her more than that. Let's give her a flat 30 grand. Right. And we'll keep the rest. Right. And I didn't say anything. Yeah. I, and then we get on the phone and we start yeah. our conversation. <laughs> And Bryant goes into his pitch and says, well, here's what we're going to do. We were going to give you just 25% like the contract, but we think giving you 30 grand, right. which, is, which is a bet, yeah. which is like 15% or 12, whatever right. it was. Yeah. Um, it's like 10. 10%, I think. whatever it was. Like, it's not the best, but at right. least it's more than 25%. Right. Does that make you happy? And you were very methodical and quiet. And you said, yeah. Cody, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Because like, I know you. And, and what did I say? You go... I want to give you all of it, except I want $1 so that I can frame it and put it on Garrett's wall so he never does this ever again. It was, it, it, it was instantaneous because yeah. I knew mm-hmm. that you, as an investor, you had an expectation. You trusted an expert. Mm-hmm. We went out there. We, we fumbled it at the last minute by pre-selling, not controlling our buyer, yeah. not controlling some expenses, not having our numbers dialed in along the way, That's which is the big the part. And that was a big lesson for us because it's like, yeah, we're, we're, a lot of times as entrepreneurs, you're running and gunning. You don't have time to go back and clean up the paperwork and clean up your right. numbers. It is so vitally important as a builder, especially if the market's turning. Right. Builders are boom and bust. Yeah. You're either murdering it and making right. crazy money or you go out of business yes. real fast. And that was the first house we were really like dealing with the market pulling yeah. back and it was hitting the market at the worst time right. and everything just kind of fell apart. And that's what we did. Yeah. We gave you everything but $1. Yeah. And we framed that dollar. And I Did you really Yeah, we're going to make a plaque. And it's going to say, <laughs> as a great reminder, to build for profit, not for brand. Right. Not, nothing wrong with building a high quality product. No. But when you have investors in your deal, you have to think about their money just as yes. much as you think about the deal itself or right. the way the house is or your buyer. It's almost like investor first. Right. And then, yes. And what did you say to me after I said, this is what I would do? I said, that's exactly what I would have done too, right? Like there have been many times where I have eaten into our own profit or been willing to take zero if it meant my investors hit their pro forma. Because when you're an LP in a deal, like as your LP, I didn't have control. I couldn't say, no, go, don't go, don't put this door in. Don't do that with the Shanna. Like, I don't know. And quite frankly, like that's not my role in this partnership. Right. Yeah. And you as the sponsor, right? Like when we're in sponsor positions, we can control that and we should have known. And, you know, I'll say more than anything, I think what would have totally changed the tone of everything that happened was 
I had every month I would get an email, right? And it would be like, we're on time, we're on great. budget, on time, on budget, on time, on budget. And it was like that. And then it was like, hey, great news. We're closing in a month. Awesome. And then I get, we need to talk right now. And yeah. I'm like, how did this happen in two yeah. weeks? Well, and the worst part about it is I got the same. At the same time. At the same time. Right. And I was like, how did this happen? Right. In Right. A few weeks. Right. And but it, it was the right move. And what's great, not only did you say that's the right answer, yeah, which is. I was just grateful because, yeah. you you know, part of me wanted to pony up even more and be like, look, I told you I was going to return a hundred grand. Yeah. Here's your hundred grand. I appreciate that. But we did what we did. Garrett learned a very valuable lesson where we dialed in our numbers our now, yeah. like so <laughs> fast. Like Garrett's like, I'm never making that mistake again. And uh, more importantly, you said the magic words to me. Afterwards. What did I say? That I I would consider reinvesting with you again? Yes. Yeah, because listen, I didn't invest with you because I was like, oh, we're going to be like super rich and whatever. Like, yeah, of course we want to make money together. But I invested with you for two reasons, right? One, I know I can trust you. And two, I want to keep supporting your business so that you can continue growing because I know this is the first of many deals that we're doing together, right? Like I wanted to deepen that relationship with you. Right. Cause yeah. strategically, I wanted, like, I want Cody to have to pick up my phone calls. Right. Like, I want to be in your world. And you actually said this on one of my social media. Like, we did a, a selfie video together. I was like, how do people get in your world? And you go, cut the check. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. You cut yep. the check. That's how you do it. Because now, when you have this much of my money, when I call you, you're answering my call, right? Yep. Like, you're responding back to me. But I can't do that if I'm like, just, asking you for things and asking you for things. Well, you got to play the long game. And I, and I, when I think about our relationship, I'm like this little house deal that we did is nothing compared no. to the bigger picture. Like I said, I want to, you're my mentor, multifamily. I already knew yeah. we're going to go out and make a tremendous amount of money together. Yeah, but if I damage this relationship and yeah. it would have been damaged, e it, even subconsciously, you yeah. might've been like, cool. And I could have bullied my way around. It's yeah. like, Dina, that's the contract. You're a yeah. big girl investor. Yeah. Pull I up your said, okay. is Like, this is what it is. You would have said, okay, yeah. Spurbs, yeah. I got you. Yeah. I got you. But it would have hurt the relationship. Probably. And so the lesson for everybody who's especially new, I've made it over 18 years in this business because I I never put the money first. I always put the relationship yeah. first and my integrity and brand first. Yes. When you think like that, yeah, you're going to take some L's along the way or maybe you feel a little injustice. Like that's not how it was supposed to be. But there's two sides to every story. She was feeling that same way of like, how yeah. did we end up here? Because we miscommunicated. Yeah. We need to take extreme ownership constantly, yeah. always as entrepreneurs. And um, I know that because we made that little deal, Garrett's going to learn a valuable lesson. <laughs> Bryant watched me make the right call, which yeah. is good for him because, you know, he's a cheap mofo. And he's always like, <laughs> I no, know, no, 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 like, no. Always like, like come on, Bryant, Bryant. Big picture. Don't be penny wise other, and pound foolish. He told me the other day, hey, man. I, they wanted to charge me, you know, 30 grand for this grass, this fake grass. And I got yeah. it done for four. I went over there. There's 16 Mexican guys with rusty nails hammering in like this cheap ass grass. And I'm like, Brian, what is this? Is the, whole, oh, the whole entire grass had to get ripped out with all these rusty nails like everywhere. A, they put the wrong nails in. When you put oh fake grass gosh. in, if you don't put like the, the right, right nails. nails can you imagine somebody at one of our Airbnb stepping on a rusty nail? And there was thousands of them because they were just like hammering that in the grass. That is not a lesson you like, want to learn. No, 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 no. Up. Let's go. <laughs> That's penny Sometimes wise, pound cheap, foolish. Cheap doesn't work. Yeah, no. Um, what is that? You Price is what you pay, value is what you get. Yep. Like, this is not a good way to find that out. Yep. All right. So look, what what's the future look like? How do you feel about the market? Let's oh yeah, the let's market. talk about that real quick. Ah, uh, yes. Um, well, interest rates are moving. Uh, Powell has not been quiet about his intentions to continue pulling this lever. Actually, you spoke at a conference that we were at last year. Okay. And you delivered the keynote, right? And so um, I think like I had spoken in the morning about raising capital and then you know, day went on, day went on. And then Cody gets on stage and I'm like, you know, I always listen to what you have to say because you're just, you're such a phenomenal speaker. And so I'm like sitting there listening and I'm like recording so that I can like go back and look at it. And you're talking about like, interest rates are just going to keep going up. This was in August of 2022. Mm -hmm. And you're like, interest rates are going to get to like above 8%. And then all of you that aren't investing in real estate, this is going to be the worst decision you made to not make the move now. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then, you know, you were talking about single family. And I was like, 
you're such a powerful speaker. I was like, maybe I should be in single family. Like I actually <laughs> I sat there you. thinking that. That's pretty funny. Wow, maybe I should be in single family. And then I came and found you in the green room in the back. And I was like, Cody, it was a great presentation. And, you know, I'm like sold. I'm going to be, a, I'm quitting multifamily. I'm going to be a single family investor now. But um, you're crazy if you think interest rates are going to be above 8%. And you're like, you think so? And I was like, I don't think they're going to get that high that fast. And wow, am I eating my words? Because they are like really climbing up there. Yeah. This is like back when rates were still, what, like 5% maybe? Yeah, high fours. Yeah, high fives. fours, yeah. low fives. Um, but no, we're climbing, we're climbing in that direction. So what's happening in the multifamily side is cap rates are starting to go up a little bit. Um, so the amount that we can pay for assets has come down pretty Decently. So, meaning there's better deals out there. There are better deals out there. What's really exciting though is, I shouldn't say it like this because I'm about to be like, oh, people are going to lose their shirts and I'm really excited about this because so I sound like a total asshole. But um, there are going to be a lot of sponsors that bought deals that didn't buy a rate cap on an adjustable mortgage. So you know, kind of like an arm, right? Like it moves with where the 10-year treasury is. And as that continues to rise, their interest rates are going to rise. And what's going to happen is they're not going to be able to service the debt. They're not going to be able to pay their lender. And so there's going to be a lot of multifamily that kind of swings into distressed asset territory. And that leaves people like us a whole lot of opportunity. I'm really excited you're getting into the multifamily space now. Good time. This is like... I think this is potentially going to be the biggest opportunity we see in our entire lifetime. That's how big I think this is going to be because this is not this is not a predatory lending situation like it was in the last crash, right? That was a bubble. This is not this is supply and demand meeting like a perfect storm of where interest rates are, where how people leverage assets and interest rates moving so fast. It's now creating this kind of perfect storm of opportunity for us. So as those people are unable to get into better financing, they're just going to offload it. That, they the, might fire sale it. They might, you know, go into like foreclosure. You know, so default, the deals are default. out there. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So that's where you see the next one, oh, yeah. two, three years. Yeah. Like those are the types yeah, of Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a short time frame that we have to do this. Like I think when it starts, and it's already kind of moving in that direction, but when it actually gets going, I think there'll be like 24 months for us to take advantage of it. And then that window is going to close. So like, this is the perfect time to be educating and learning and getting all of your team, your power team in place. And then when those deals come, like going and buying everything and then just riding out the rest of the storm. Yeah. Uh, then, yeah. Because real estate historically, if you look at it, it always goes up, right? If you look at it from like 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 10 years ago to now. In short term, it may fluctuate, but long term, real estate generally trends up. So this is the time. This is the this time. Is the move. You know, everyone's like so excited about the last like bull market that we had. And they're like, oh, we made a bunch of money in the last 10 years in real estate. Yeah, but the bear market is where like stupid amounts of money are made, right? Like this is where we really make money. And we haven't had an opportunity, you and I, right? Like in our career where we, have gotten kind of to that like level where you can really take advantage of it. We have, we weren't able to do that in the last, or at least I, I wasn't able to, because I graduated college in 2007. Um, so I, now you're really excited. Got, yeah, now you yeah. get to be part of like a real market right. cycle and shift. Right. And, all that. and yeah. I didn't know what this, I didn't know. About I that. feel it. I mean, I've been feeling it for a while now. Yeah. So this is, this is exciting yeah. times. And what, what would you say to a, a new female entrepreneur? Come on, yes. let's get on our okay. soapbox. Come on, let's right, end this thing strong. Women? What would you say to a new female entrepreneur that's, okay. th that's hearing this and saying, damn, Dina's a badass. Yeah. I want to be like her. I want to yeah. get in the game. I want to, I want to dominate like her. $900 mil a billion dollars worth of multi. Yeah. Let's go. What would I say to them if they want to get started? Just in general, like, okay. like, like spit some game. Okay. So I feel like when I talk about like women in this space and like minorities in this space, people think they hear me say, there should be no white men in this space. That's not what I'm saying at all, right? What I'm saying is, if you look at the top, right, like at the high level, it's predominantly white dudes. Crusty old white guys. Right. I got it. Yeah, I right. hear what you're saying. I wasn't going to say the crusty part, yeah. but uh, no, but it's like all white, white men, which I personally, like my brand and my entire company has been built on the thesis that we only want the best of the best. And so when we're looking at the top, 
if like 95, 99% are white men, then one of two things is happening, right? Like either we don't believe 50% of the population is qualified to be in these positions. We don't think 50% of the population is smart enough, good enough, whatever. Or number two, that we just don't care enough. And I really believe that it's probably we're not caring enough and we're not making conscious efforts to create those opportunities. And so I, you, like I said, have been the most pivotal person in my entire trajectory of my career. And you're not, you're a white man, right? Just slightly crusty. Maybe, it depends. Yeah, just, just. (laughs) Yeah, slightly slightly crusty. Slight crust. Right. And you've single-handedly changed my entire trajectory. And so it takes white men and men in general to champion and create those spaces. Like your, your event that you did last year was so diverse, especially in the real estate space. Like we don't see stages where you see like women and minority, like, but your stage was so diverse. And I think that doesn't happen without intentionality and without you being aware that this is an issue. And I know you put effort into it and I appreciate that about you. It's incredible. And I, I'm sure you're reaping the success mm. of that, right, too? Because diversity is a strength. It's not a weakness. Well, it's it. diversity is a strength. And my number one closer is a female. My favorite re- me- multifamily member <laughs> is a female. Like the, some of the biggest needle movers in my life, the advice came from women. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take somebody, I'm pretty, pretty, I don't have special talents. I'm a D student. I did smoke a lot of weed. I'm smart enough to know like, hey, right. there's something there with that emotional intelligence. And um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So so you would say what? I would say- Don't let anybody hold your ass back. Get your no, ass going. Yeah. Get in the game. Find you a Cody. Like, I find you, you a crusty yeah. white guy. <laughs> I find put you, you an crusty white man. Yeah, I know. No, but it really, it's, you belong here. Like we belong here. We have a responsibility to your daughter and my daughters for them to see people that look like them operating at this level so that they too know it's possible, right? It changes when they see representation at the top. And so I'd say, you know, you belong here. There's many reasons not to do this, but you need to ask yourself, like, what happens if you don't, right? That I think mm, I said that I at the clever that. stage, right? I love like, that. It's not, what if I do this? It's what happens if I don't? And you, what I want to do, and the whole reason I'm doing this is I want to set up success, not just for my, like for myself and my husband and my family, and not just for my daughters, but for generations that aren't even born yet. I want to impact those generations. I want to leave a legacy for my family. And, you know, I came here, the daughter of two immigrants. My parents had $26 when they came, so they had no money. And to go from like there to like where my daughters are starting out is that's the American dream, right? In, in one lifetime, you were yeah. able to like set it up generationally. Yeah. yeah. That's the power of real estate. I know. Yeah. And having a mom that says, quit your damn job and yeah, just go quit for your it. Job. You know yeah. how cool that is? Like, yeah. I love that. My parents sat me down and said, listen, you're making a fucking mistake. <laughs> you are not cut what out are for we real gonna estate. Do with you? <laughs> you're, you're more of like the just go get a job and don't get fired type of guy. Like just hold it together. Uh, that's great. That's funny because um, I was like- the And that's boss. a joke. If my dad's listening, my dad was a, a great champion <laughs> of pushing me to become an entrepreneur. He put up with my my drug selling and please yeah, show up at the house. That's your first entrepreneurial yeah. endeavor. <laughs> well, it was candy. It was okay, candy. Yeah, course. you got to start, start somewhere, somewhere. Yeah, you, you got to start somewhere. You graduate. Right. It's funny because my parents, I think like they had that talk with me when I was like, listen, I'm not going to be a doctor or an engineer. And they were like- <laughs> But you're Indian. Where did you we have go to wrong? <laughs> yeah, where did we go wrong? Then I, later I was like, okay, but I'll marry a doctor. All right. And hey, they were like, all right, you're redeeming around. yourself now. <laughs> we knew you were creative, you know, that's smart. You're always cutting right. deals. Right, like trying to find the shortcut. And it was the shortcut because I didn't have to go to med school. Yeah, so. there you go. Well, um, look, thank you for spending the time thank with you. us here. Here, And how do people find you? If they want to yeah. connect, if they want to get involved. So we mentioned Vive Funds. Yeah. You can Google Vive Funds and it's there. Yeah. What's the website? Uh, Vivefunds.com. There you go. Vivefunds.com. <laughs> so, yeah. You're now crushing it with the content. Yeah. How do they find you on Instagram? 
Vena Jetty, V E E N A J E T T I. Boom. And I highly recommend if uh, you, you're interested in multifamily, if you're interested in making your money go to work for you, um, you know, like I said, I put my money with, with Vena because I trust her. She's Appreciate phenomenal you. at what she does. And she is one of the smartest people in every single room. Uh, I know you said, I'm trying I don't want to be. be. You are. But I'm in the wrong you're, room. You're, no, that's not true. I've seen you. You're now in some really great rooms. That's because of you. And you're still a badass. That's because of you. I'm in those well, rooms. Well, don't forget about me. Take oh. me to the top, Vina. <laughs> How could I forget about you? I literally would do anything for you. You're amazing. Oh, I love that. But Say I have that to again. tell you, you know, you're amazing. You're the best. Literally. I, and I meant every word I said. I'm not just saying this to like blow smoke up can, your ass. Can you say it with like a… An a- AMSR voice. Yes. As an, I don't know how to do this. The cleverest. <laughs> that's that's a whole like we just lost every viewer yeah, right now. Every probably, listener just unplugged. We probably, I now have a four star review, a three star review. <laughs> <laughs> on my episode. Oh my gosh, don't give me a four star review. I have to look good in front that's of That's what I should have dudes. you saying in the mic. I'll, I I'll, I'll like quiet, like just give them a five star review. Do it right now, Apple. If you do it, <laughs> you get you get nothing in return. <laughs> no, you can feel good about it. That's right. Right. You can, they'll be supporting women in real estate. Yeah, there yeah. So don't do it for me. Do it for me. Do it for me. <laughs> do it for the women out there. What were you about to say? I was going to say, you know what I did? You don't, I, you maybe don't know this. I don't know if, I can't remember if I talked to you about it. I started a Facebook community. Boom. And How do they how do they get yeah. involved in that? Okay, so it's called Mastering Multifamily with Vina Jetty. Okay. It's like free to join. You just have to like answer Say that questions. a bunch of times. Mastering Multifamily with Vina Jetty. With Vina Jetty. Okay. Yeah. So they just go to Facebook, yeah. search Mastering Multifamily with Vina Jetty, yeah. and it's free to join. Yeah. You just like answer the questions. And now you ha- see community is so important because if you put them all in, in this bucket yeah. and you're just loving on that community, yeah. over time, that thing's going to become an unstoppable oh, so train. It fills me up so much to just like pour into the people that are in that group. So- it's a community. It's not a group. It's a community. And I, you know, I stole this. You know who I stole yeah, this from? Yeah, from Pace. Yeah, Pace yeah. Morby. He's like, his community is amazing. The best. It's phenomenal. I don't even know how anybody can have done what he did. A lot of love and on that so, community, which is what you're modeling. Yes. Boom. Yeah, I'm like just trying to be like. So go join everybody. Just go join it. You're yeah. you're dropping multifamily conversations. Yeah. You're doing entrepreneurship conversations. You're yeah. pushing people to network. Yeah. And are you pointing them in the direction of like these are the types of deals we're looking yes. for? This is the type of things. Yes, I have my get- buy box or my buy criteria Ooh, in there. Right. Yeah. And then I have I have Vina's Vault, which is in the Facebook group. Um, it's actually on Teachable. I I. Gave you codes for it. I don't know if you logged yeah, in yeah, yet. I think yeah, I saw yeah. a login. Yeah, I'm putting my team through it. You did? Okay. Of course. Do you yeah. need more? With, with, do I need more what? Logins? More, more logins? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm good okay. right now. But All right, let I me do, know. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So that's if they want to go a little bit deeper with some of the content. Yeah. So what I do is I'll do these like one-off Zooms. Again, taking a page out of Pace's playbook because he'll go for like hours and hours and hours and not. I like cap out at three hours. It's a lot. Zooms. It's a lot of time. But I love it. And we'll take like one topic. So like um, reaching out to a broker and then we'll just dive into that. And the Zooms are actually free. So like anybody in the group can join them. The thing is, is like my Zoom account's limited to 100. So if you're not one of the first 100, Vina, you can't You are there. rich. What are you doing not upgrading to the thousand person? Do I need to pay for your upgrade? What is going on yeah. here? I know. I don't, Get your life together, you Vina. You know what it was? I didn't think anyone would show up for my first Zoom. <laughs> you didn't, I want, you didn't want to have a big people. party, a big room with <laughs> one, three Nobody people in it? <laughs> Listen, guys, it's not my fault. Zoom only holds five people. Yeah, right. Well, that's. I thought like five people would show up. So I didn't have anything planned. But I people ha- are showing. There were a, over 100 people in three minutes. Yeah, yeah. And then can I you had, upgrade, like, please? I'm, I don't know. I'm going to think about it. Yeah. I don't know. It's, Just do it. Uh, you think so? Yeah, yeah. After How I mean, many look, can your Zoom take? I don't want to brag, but this, uh, oh, my Zooms are huge. All right. Yeah, the big, yeah, that's, the I'm Z. known for big Zs. <laughs> the big Z. <laughs> um, uh, after listening to this podcast, we're going to have at least five or 10 more people in your Zoom. Yes. That's, so my I'll viewership's like growing. 11 people. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Don't worry. <laughs> no, but like how many people can you have in your Zoom? 10,000? No, I, I unlocked that at one point where we were paying some insane amount because we did uh, a live event where we had like 15,000 or some 10, 10 or 15, 12,000 oh. people on. So we paid for like this extra ability, but it yeah. was so expensive and it was only for the event and we shut it back down. No, a thousand. Wow. Okay. A thousand, okay, a thousand. On, on a Zoom. Like, Do you like fill the room? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. But there's some psychology behind it because when 
people aren't able to get on yeah. and they have to watch replays. They now register right away. Yeah. They get on early. They, they want yeah, to be Yeah, that actually it. does happen. So people will be like, I'm logging in two hours early just to like wait yeah. so I can get into the room. So get on Venus Vault. Get on. Yeah. Get involved in the stuff. Yeah. The Facebook group. So yeah. you're, you're passionate about that. Yeah. And, and my vault's like super affordable. And go show her some love on her Instagram. Yeah. All right. Now yeah. we're connected. And also like follow you because… I mean, they probably already are because they, they're here, but just in case. Yeah. Well, and more important than follow it, more important than following, I want this podcast to grow. Yeah. So share it with right. other people. That's that's the ask that I'm gonna give everybody is yeah. to share this. I love the reviews. Obviously, if you're getting value from this, like this was a technical conversation. Yeah. Because you're a high level plan, you're you're a high level entrepreneur and investor yeah. playing at a very high level. I don't get an opportunity to have these kind of conversations. Sometimes we do personal development motivation right. from people who make a lot of money and then they go and invest it. Right. Which by the way, how are you making your money matter? We're just going to end quickly on that. Yeah. So we do a lot of grassroots, like philanthropic work. Uh, last month we raised, I actually am always raising money apparently because I also raise from the people around me. So I'm like, give me your money for this investment and also donate your money to whatever cause I'm working on. And so last month we did a toy drive in the Dallas area and we gave over 400 kids had Christmas because we did this. And it wasn't just me. It was all of my community, my friends, everybody came together to do this. The month before that, we did a suicide prevention walk, uh, like a, I think like a 5k walk or something. So you're leveraging your network to like- yeah, do this, like, these causes. It's just I love expensive that. to be my friend. So <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I love it. Make 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 a lot of money, but make it matter. Um, and by Wait. the way, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you next oh, yeah. year. You got to get involved in our toy drive. So oh, yeah. last year we did the world's largest toy drive. Broke I saw the Guinness that with Book Dan, of World right? Records. Yeah, yes, my, my I business do partner that. Dan Fleischman. The, in 2023, we're opening up a bunch of new cities. Love it. And Phoenix is going to be one of them. Um, Give me I, Dallas. Obviously, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll be doing it in Texas and in Dallas. Sure. And uh, so people will be announcing it. People can bring all their toys to this building. I love it. And then we're going to, you know, put it on big rigs and and ship it out. To, I love that. Uh, yes, I definitely LA, want to be part of that. Because you go. guys crush it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was an incredible. insane amount of yeah, toys. Yeah. And, you know, it's no kid deserves to not have Christmas. Well, I mean, I'm sure there's some little shitheads out you there. You maybe didn't deserve pretty, to have Christmas. I was Christmas. a bad kid. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> okay, wait. I have an ask for your audience too. Okay. Okay. Because I'm the first woman that you've had on your podcast, right? Or am I the second? No, you might be the first. I think for this show, I think, I think, for this show, I'm I the think first. you're the first one. Yeah. Okay. I need you guys, like he said, to <laughs> share. Me. Yeah. No, I, I want to be the best you've had so far. But okay. not the last. Definitely not the last, but yeah. I already know that about you. So I don't yeah. have to say that. Yeah. Okay. So you guys have to, he said share, but you also, and I know we've been talking about five-star reviews, but for real five-star reviews and give it to me like after this episode drops so I can go to all your other guests and I can be like, you did a good I job, but like I crushed I it. I brought right? the like, heat. Yeah, sorry. So, so the women need to come yeah. show up and support. No, the men have to sh- show up too to support the women because that's what you do. Yeah. It's not just the women. Women have to support the men also. Yeah. Well, and you have to have your friends do it too. I, like the I love ripple it. effect. I want I want all the support, all the love because yes. you're a fantastic thank guest. You. So thank you for sharing your time thank with you. us. I love you. And, thank uh, you for hey, go, me. go follow Vina. All right. So for everybody else that's uh, watch, not watching this on YouTube, go ahead and go check out uh, this podcast on all streaming platforms. But that's all we have for now. Until next time, we're out of here. Take care. Comb your hair. Peace. <laughs> Hey, thanks for being a subscriber of The Clever Investor Show. As a thank you gift, we wanted to give you something that we know is gonna help you get started as a creative real estate investor. It's our real estate success kit and it's completely free. Just go to www.reisuccesskit.com to customize your kit, but essentially it's a collection of 15 training tools designed to help you get results quickly as a creative real estate investor. From systems to lead generation to finding cash buyers to creative ways to close deals and get paid. Your free REI success kit is just a few clicks away. Once again, the website's www.reisuccesskit.com.